Okay, so lecture 13, mortgages, uh, moving on to think about the bank's ability to sell the mortgaged property. So usually in a situation where a property will have been repossessed in the first instance, and then the bank are pushing for the sale in order to realise their debt. So they're looking to um, refinance, obviously, return the funds back to themselves in um, having seized and then sold the mortgage property. So in this session, what I want to look at how is how the bank, in the first instance, have the ability to behave that way. So we know already from repossession, we were looking for dry ink, so not necessarily any wrongdoing, but there usually would be in those scenarios. And also thinking about um, how that differs than where we see a right to sale. Are we looking for any wrongdoing on behalf of the mortgagor? Uh, how the mortgagee, so how the lender or the bank behave whenever they have pushed for a sale. So how do the bank respond and um, deal with this situation? How are they having to conduct the sale? So how do they have to respect the mortgagor in that situation? Who can they sell to? What price should they achieve? Etc. We will look at also. The impact then of the sale, so what does that do as regards the payment of the debt, the impact on a new purchaser um, and the, the legal ramifications and framework for that. Whether then a mortgagor can respond in some way, so how the lender would respond to an action for sale of the mortgage property, bearing in mind that we've already considered how a mortgagor would respond to a repossession, so court order coming in and Section 36 of the Administration of Justice Act 1970, allowing for a response mechanism by the mortgagor. So how does that operate in a sale? Finally, kind of capping off on those other remedies that the bank have available to them. We've touched on them briefly before. We'll outline them again very briefly at the start of this session and then um, consider them at the end. So these are the ones that are available to the bank. We've already discussed repossession in the previous lecture. So we've dealt with one out of five and we're going to cover the other, five, uh, the other four today with power of sale being the one that really we focus on for the main. So that's what we will be considering in this lecture we'll be looking at the full powers of sale for the bank then briefly touch on foreclosure appointment of a receiver and the remaining ability for the um, bank to be able to sue on the borrower's covenant to repay the debt okay so the first of those uh, five that we're covering today we haven't covered one previously we're on to number two so we're looking at the bank's statutory power of sale the mortgagee's statutory power of sale meaning that it's enshrined in statute so this allows for the uh, bank obviously to be able to sell the mortgaged property in order to do so we have two statutory provisions to look at and considering how the bank have the ability to behave that way. The power to sell has to have both arisen, meaning it becomes uh, it's something that exists. So section 101 of the Law of Property Act 1925 deals with the power arising, so coming into being, and then it has to become exercisable. So they have to be able to operate on it or use it under section 103 of the Law of Property Act 1925. So 101 and 103 are dealing with the bank's statutory ability to sell the property, but the power itself has to have arisen or come, in, come into being, and then the bank have to be able to operate or exercise that ability to use that function. So those are the two statutory measures that we look at first when we're thinking about the bank's statutory power of sale. So the coming into existence of the right to sell under 101 occurs 
if both of the following conditions are met. So what we would look at would be that the mortgage is a legal mortgage, so the mortgage has been made by deed, and the mortgage money itself has become due. So what that would mean is that we know for a legal mortgage we would be looking for a deed and that's why as a legal interest it's very important that the bank have protected it in that way. It was always capable of being legal. In order to make it legal they then needed a deed and that is the thing that really allows them or gives them power or sway to sell the property. So it's very, very, very rare now to have an equitable mortgage because um, Section 87 of the Land Registration Act requires it really to have been done uh, for registered land and then also we have this need for it to have been done in order for the bank or the lender to be able to sell the property. So we have a, a kind of doubling up here of the need for this mortgage to have been evidenced through the right document and that's why we have laboured that point a number of times sometimes the document really helps us at a later stage either at land registry or in some other aspect of the dispute so equitable mortgages are incredibly rare uh, we can touch on them briefly but equitable mortgages really don't um, allow for much sway in court because the bank aren't able to use a lot of the statutory provisions that they could rely upon if it had been made by deed. So we were, we're looking for a legal mortgage made by deed for the right of the power of sale to come into being. The other thing is that the mortgage money must be due. Now what will have happened there is that the bank will have uh, put in place a fictitious date. They will create a date that's six weeks to three months after the date that the mortgage document has been signed. Now that might sound very strange, a thing to do, but what that allows for is it's there to protect both parties really. So it allows for in six weeks to three months time, the bank to be able to operate in this way if they need to sell, if, there, if there's some sort of issue. So if you backtrack thinking about last lecture thinking about repossession or when the bank could have repossessed the bank could have repossessed pretty much from the minute the contract was signed if they found out after signature that there was some fraud or some sort of deception or the person was misrepresenting in some way they would have been able to seize the property straight away and move in and take it from the wrongdoer or take it from the borrower and then by putting in a fictitious uh, allowance for the money to be due date six weeks to three months they would then have the ability to sell the property six weeks later and hopefully return the funds back to themselves the other reason for that fictitious date is that it allows for the it also helps the borrower if the borrower was to have a windfall or an inheritance or win the lottery it would allow them to turn around to the bank six weeks in three months in and say oh i've won a million pounds i'm going to buy the house i'm going to satisfy the debt and i'm going to take my house back thank you very much so this mortgage money must be due isn't the 20 year term of the mortgage and waiting those 20 years for that money to have been repaid. The money, mortgage money can be asked for in full six weeks to three months. There will be a fictitious date somewhere in that timeline uh, as to when the, either party can satisfy the debt. The bank can ask for it back or the borrower can pay the bank and take the property back. And, and that allows freedom really for both parties. So at this stage, we're not looking for any wrongdoing. Just for the ability for the bank to sell the property, we are looking for a legal, legal mortgage and that fictitious date of six weeks to three months 
after the document having been signed to have been passed. That's all we need for a rising. It's usually quite easy to tick that one off. We're looking for a legal mortgage and it's it's more than three months past them having signed a legal mortgage. Under section 103, however, we would find that the bank could operate on that right of sale, the ability to exercise it or use it, if any of the following, so that's any of the following conditions are met. If the mortgagee, so the, the lender, has served notice on the mortgagor, the borrower, requiring payment of the mortgage money, and the mortgagor has failed to pay for three months after receiving the, the notice. Uh, so that's usually either the bank needs the money for some reason and they ask for it all, or and obviously somebody's not able to give it all of the money back. And within three months, the, the bank would have the ability to sell. Or there's three months worth of debt outstanding on the mortgage money. So failure to pay over three months worth of mortgage repayments. So that would be one way that the, the bank could sell the property would be if they ask for money to be repaid and the mortgage or can't do it or they are in arrears for three months. If the interest under the mortgage, so this is just the interest on the debt, is two months or more in arrears. So this is lack of payment, obviously, of the mortgage for two months or more. Or the borrower is in breach of some other covenant in the mortgage deed other than the repayment of mortgage money or interest. And that would be that sort of stuff that we looked at previously, like um, they have to maintain it, they have to insure it, they have to check what type of a tenant they have in there if they're allowed to have a tenant at all. So if the bank find that any of these things are in error or they need the money back and they've asked for it and given you three months to go get a mortgage elsewhere to help them get the money and you haven't been able to, then in that situation the bank can seek the sale of the property. And that first one might seem quite harsh because of not necessarily any wrongdoing but if the, it's like anyone who lends money, if they need it back they need it back and there might be some term put in there that allows for them to ask for it and that's effectively by putting that six week to three month fictitious date within which they can ask for all of the money back that's what they're doing they're allowing themselves the ability to call in the debt and say we need it back now please and we can see that northern rock and bank banks that have folded have had to do that at times Okay, so under 101, we're looking for a legal mortgage by deed and we're looking for that fictitious date to have passed. For 103, we'd be considering whether the bank has either asked for the money or there's three months arrears on the mortgage repayments. Uh, or there's two months arrears on the interest or some other breach of a covenant of the mortgage agreement between the two parties. Any of those will allow the bank to action a sale of the land. Previously, we thought about whether a bank should seek a, a court order in regards to repossession. And now we could look at that in determining whether a bank have the ability to sell, to sell without one. Uh, and this case was key Horsham Properties and Clark and Beach. So we have quite recent case law that determines this and considers human rights law also. So we have the borrowers, Clark and Beach, falling into arrears on their payments. So they are falling into arrears on their mortgage repayments. The lenders don't obtain a court order. So we can see at the top there we have um, the mortgage of the property given by Clark and Beach to the lender uh, and in return for money obviously they default on their payment if we move downwards however the lender doesn't take possession of the property 
So they don't seek a repossession. They don't seek a court order for that. We don't have a court order at any stage. So we don't have a court order for the repossession. They then sell it on to the company called Horsham Properties. Again, without a court order. So we have Horsham effectively taking a property with people in there. So they have bought a property with defaulting mortgagors inside it. And Horsham obviously need to get them out. So Horsham want to take possession of the property that they've bought with these two people inside. Obviously on the basis that the two people inside have become trespassers because it's no longer their property. It's been sold above them. 101, it had arisen in that there was a legal mortgage by deed that had passed its date, its mortgage money's due date. Uh, come into being are exercisable under section 103 because they were in arrears, they've been asked, they'd fallen behind and therefore the bank can use that ability to sell. It was sold but they were still in there so at no stage do we have a court order during any of this process. The only court order that gets applied for is for Horsham to try and get them out because they've bought a house with trespassers in it. So Horsham Register is the true owner. They apply for a court order and they get one to, to get the property vacant. But um, Clark and Beach obviously resist the possession, claiming that the lender should have pursued a court order at some stage. And they argue breach of Article 1 of Human Rights Act. So they are arguing against the unlawful deprivation of their possessions. The court order was given in favour of them, in favour of Horsham to remove them and their rights under Section 36 of the Administration Justice Act 1970 didn't apply at any stage of this because we didn't have their borrower behaving that way. We have the new purchaser behaving this way. The courts, however, held that there had been no breach of rights at any stage as the lender were acting under a private contractual agreement and there was no statutory provision um, used at any stage, which is a very odd thing to say when you're thinking about it arising and becoming exercisable under Section 101 and Section 103. What that has done is that's led to a consultation paper in Parliament and the recommendation is that the borrower, that unless the borrower agrees to vacate, there should be a court order in order to satisfy either a possession or a sale. But that's the current law. So the current law we're left with is that it's advisable <laughs> to seek a court order. But we know with Ropa Gaelic it's not essential. Similarly here, it's advisable to seek a court order but not law so at neither stage do you have to seek a court order and technically somebody can buy land with the previous borrowers inside it and effectively make them a trespasser if the right has arisen and it become exercisable under sections 101 and 103 so it's quite an odd scenario to, to conceptualise that you've, you've borrowed money from a bank, you have a relationship with them, they're writing to you, you've fallen on hard times, you're in default. Uh, at no stage do you feel like you're in threat of, of somebody coming in and throwing you out, so you stay living there and you just keep getting letters, but none of them are in reference to a court order or any kind of proceedings against you, so you just keep hanging in there because that's what you would be told to do. And then one day the house belongs to someone else and you are facing a court order but there's nothing you can do about it because the person that you borrowed the money from didn't use any process to try and evict you. So very odd and um, kind of tricksy way of, of dealing with things. It's not the norm and there are protocols and procedures um, and good lending practices that should prohibit such behaviours. Uh, but, but technically, 
it's allowed legally to happen. So that's quite bizarre. <laughs> so how do the bank have to behave whenever they are selling? We're thinking about how the bank then view their relationship to the borrower whenever they are in control of the sale of land. So a bank will have already repossessed and now they are selling the land. Obviously it's in everyone's interest that they make the most of that property in order to achieve the most money because the bank will want to be repaid in full and the property owner who is now evicted will want to hopefully walk away with something and not be in any more debt. So it's in everyone's interest that this property raises as much money as possible. So then you have to think about, okay, so what should we make the bank do? How should we make the bank behave in relation to that property? Should we make them look at the market and think about when the best time to sell would be? Should it uh, decide whether to rent it for now and sell it at a later stage? Uh, because that would be financially more sensible. How should the bank behave towards this property? The leading case in this area is coming from Sylvan. Uh, and Sylvan, the argument was that the property uh, was worth a certain amount but had great potential. Um, they were in the process of applying for planning permission, but they hadn't quite gotten there. So they were um, going through the motions of applying for planning, planning permission to make the property more profitable as a development. But that hadn't happened yet. And their argument was that the bank should have seen that process through in order to maximise the asset and make more money for everybody involved that it would have been in the best interest to see to, to finish off the, the planning permission process and um, maximise the asset. However, the courts viewed that in that situation, somebody would have to be behaving as if they're a trustee. A trustee would look at what was in the best interests of the party and do whatever it took to maximise the asset, whether that be to rent it out, to um, divide it up, to sell it, to wait and sell it at a later date, to get planning permission, to uh, put it in an auction. You know, a, a trustee would have to, but would be tasked with thinking about their beneficiary and maximising the asset. The courts said that that's not what a bank's role were. They viewed that a mortgagee was not a trustee of the power of sale for the mortgagor and had to operate on their own interests to realise the debt, to kind of satisfy the debt and get, their, get some return for themselves. And their obligation wasn't towards the mortgagor as if there was a trustee beneficiary relationship. So... The power of sale exists for the lender's benefit and they are therefore not a trustee. They do not have to think about the borrower uh, specifically in that scenario and what would be in their best interest. However, they do have to act in good faith so there can't be any kind of wrongdoing or um, kind of any sneaky behaviour, any... Um, we look at selling to friends and stuff like that, they still have to operate in good faith and they do have a duty as to obtaining fair market price. So there, there is a need to ensure that there is transparency in the transaction, but they don't have to do everything it would take to maximise the asset the way a trustee would. So then, so that was looking at the nature how do the bank have to behave? And then we look at specifically what do those duties involve or comprise of? So do they have a duty to 
uh, sell at a specific time or to behave a certain way as to when they sell or if they sell. And our, our course, uh, our case of Sylvan again helps us appreciate the fact that the bank again have no duty at any time to exercise their powers as a mortgagee to sell, to take possession or to appoint a receiver and preserve the security or its value or to realise their security. They can remain totally passive. So again, the bank don't have to pursue a sale. They can just seize a property and sit on it if they want to. It becomes theirs effectively so they can kind of do what they like with it. And decide whether or when they want to sell it. The mortgagee obviously is not a trustee of the power of sale for the mortgagor. They are at all times free to consult their own interests alone. And whether and when to exercise their power of sale. The mortgagee's decision is not constrained by reason of the fact that the exercise or non-exercise of the power will occasion loss or damage to the mortgagor. So it's quite... Um, <sighs> quite harsh really if you look at it and thinking about how the bank are viewing their obligations to the borrower obviously you are in a situation where somebody has defaulted but it's not always through fault of their own people can fall on hard times I think the justification can only be made that obviously it is in the bank's interest to maximize the asset and to achieve best price but the purpose and point of Sylvan is that the bank can't be placed under any pressure or pushed by the borrower to behave a certain way or as to whether or when they sell. The mortgagee can't be forced to take possession, can't be forced to sell, even if that's what the borrower wants or it's in their best interest or it's in everyone's best interests. The mortgagee can remain entirely passive if they want to. So that's the exercise of the power of sale as to when they do it entirely down to them obviously that relates to timing as well Cookmere evidences that already upholding Sylvan in that regard that it is settled that a mortgagee is not a trustee they're entitled to exercise whenever they choose to do so um, it, they can choose a, a time that is unpropitious so that's not good <laughs> they can choose a time that isn't great um, they have a right to realize the security by turning into money whenever they want to so again we have Cookmere upholding this notion that it's the bank's decision when they want to sell it it's their asset to realize um, Cookmere is quite interesting we'll come back to it in a moment but one of the one strain we get from Cookmere is that the bank can sell it immediately if they want to, even if a delay or holding off would result in a higher price. So as regards timing, Cookmere looks like it's going to be quite a harsh outcome. However, there's another aspect of Cookmere that means that the bank could have behaved wrongly in that situation in that case. China and South Sea Bank and Tansi Gun Jin, sorry, Tansun Jin, uh, is a situation where we've got um, an ability to delay a sale. So this is where they could see that prices were falling. Um, however, due to their own processes and procedures, they were going to have to delay a sale. And the bank viewed that there'd been no wrongdoing in that situation, even where they knew that prices were falling, they could delay the sale because of already upholding Sylvan of this idea that they can kind of behave however they want to in appreciating the asset as long as they're not acting in bad faith and they're getting market price at the time that they decide to do it. Um, so even if they know that the, that the market's falling, uh, whenever they decide to sell it, if they get fair market price at that moment and they're not acting in bad faith, then there'll be no wrongdoing. So what about price? What is there in terms of value for the asset that's being sold? As we've already evidenced, well, that's slow, uh, the bank must take reasonable precautions to obtain the true market value 
of the mortgage property on the date on which they decide to make the sale. So that duty to obtain true market value or the best price does impact on how and where they put it for sale. So if it's uh, on the open market or at an auction, that's fine. But there has to be some evidence that they've tried to market it or sell it uh, in some way that would reflect what fair market price rules would be in that scenario. And again, we see in Cookmere um, something that did help this case. So there definitely is a duty to inform the buyer of all things that impact on price in order to achieve that fair market price. So do you remember when I said in Sylvan that um, a better price could have been achieved with planning permission and to get tenants in, etc. So there was an idea formulating around uh, a process that they were creating an investment opportunity within this land and they wanted the bank to carry on that process. In Cookmere, however, there already was planning permission and that wasn't disclosed to future purchasers. It wasn't put in the um, adverts or the um, explanations or the guidelines as to what somebody would be getting whenever they purchase that property. So therefore, it sold at a diminished value. So it wasn't disclosed, the value was therefore affected and court held that and in that situation there had been a breach of the duty as to price because fair market value hadn't been achieved because all of the information hadn't been supplied to the buyers to allow for fair market value to have been achieved. Okay, so where there is something that benefits the property and would impact on the value, it has to be disclosed and it has to be kind of promoted as something favourable that the property has for future buyers. Again, however, there is no duty to do something that would make it so. Um, so Sylvan, again, looking at the, no, uh, the lack of need or... A requirement to spend money to improve somewhere and increase the market value with the borrower complaining again that better price would have been achieved with planning permission and tenancies and the courts holding that the lender was not required to behave in that way and not needing to, to act like a trustee would in that scenario and also as regards value just achieving value for what was there if there is something there that adds value, you have to tell somebody, but you don't have to do any more than that. Okay, and then finally thinking about who, when I said about the, they don't have to act like a trustee, they do have to get fair market price, and they can't act in bad faith. You might think, well, what would bad faith mean? Um, uh, thinking about who they're selling to can also indicate an amount of bad faith. Who can they sell to? Is it okay for them to sell to themselves? No. <laughs> they can take the property and they can sit on it as an asset and not do anything with it and sell it whenever they like to, but they cannot sell it to themselves because that would not be a sale. So the viewpoint there is that there's not, no ability to sell it to themselves. Could they sell it to one of their associates? So we have that in Sei Kuang Lam and we have it in Corbett and Halifax. So in Sei Kuang we have the mortgagee as an individual and the buyer after the sale. So we don't have a bank in that situation. We have a person who has provided the funds, who has been the lender. Um... The sale was made of the repossessed property to that person's own company, of which they were a shareholder and director. And the question then arising as to whether that sale was improper. So the question that's usually asked in those cases is, is there any wrongdoing? Because it's not actually 
going to be completely invalid or automatically unless if there's been any wrongdoing and the lender would have to be articulated as having done wrong with some sort of proof. So the lender has to show that they've complied with the duties to achieve best price. So that reverses the kind of burden of proof in that case. And the lender would have to show they've complied with the duties to achieve their best price. In Sei Kwong, we can see that the sale was unfair because it was a restricted auction. It was only open to certain parties and therefore not a true market price was achieved in that scenario. So the lender would have to show clean hands and in this case they couldn't. So that sale was seen to be invalid and unfair. In Corbett, however, we have sale to an employee and again, um, not automatically invalid as long as there has been no wrongdoing, not in this case. We have a sale to an employee that has been conducted through true market value and not a problem. Then thinking about how clear do you have to be as regards your motivation for selling. Here we have in Merits a lender who wants to sell the property for very many reasons, not just because there's been default. So we have some notion that there are personal factors at play and the lender is dissatisfied with the borrower for more reasons than just their inability to pay. And they have other reasons for wanting to sell this property. Uh, and the court viewed that it didn't matter, again, as long as one of the intentions was to obtain what was outstanding as finance from the borrower. As long as there was some need to, to sell the property in order to realise the debt, as long as that was one of the factors, it didn't matter if there were more factors than that. Okay. So again, all of those indicating that the bank really have got a lot of flex as regards this. They can sell it when they want. They can sit on it. They don't have to sell it at all. In thinking about um, what price they get, as long as they can show its fair market price and they advertise fairly with all the benefits that it comes with and sell it to somebody in a clear and transparent way then they will be seen to be acting in good faith, achieving market value, and they don't have to behave like a trustee. Okay, so then considering what it is that a mortgagee is passing across. So under section 1041, we can evaluate what it is that then the mortgagee passes across to a new purchaser. Now that might sound strange. You're thinking about, okay, uh, of course, they're passing across a house, but they will only have ever had a percentage of a house. So what is it that, that they then pass across to the new buyer? So they pa pass across whatever estate it was that the previous mortgagor would have had. They pass across either the leasehold or freehold that they have repossessed and then sold. They sell it subject to the interests that had priority before them and they're free from everything else. So if there were other estates or interests that took priority to their loan, so say for example it was a loan after people had other people had lived there or had easements or had tenancies or whatever, then they would have to pass that estate across to somebody else with all of those other people attached. If it's been a first mortgage, it's unlikely to be that. But if it's a subsequent mortgage or it's a mortgage of a leasehold, then all they will be selling is land that is burdened in some way. So that again would impact on its value. The mortgagor usually has the right to redeem the property, so that idea that the property bounces back to them in full 
once they have paid all of the mortgage money back to the bank so what then would happen to that and obviously it's destroyed because the contract of sale that has been made to a new buyer extinguishes that um they have no mortgage monies to redeem and it's ineffective it kind of banishes or ruins the contract between everybody so they can't have the, the property back uh all they might end up with is some of the proceeds of the sale if there's been any equity in the property itself See, the effect of the sale by the bank under section 105 would be that the bank who have repossessed would pay off the first mortgage. So they pay off the mortgage with priority. They pay the costs of the sale. Then they might pay themselves if they're a second mortgage. And then if there's anything left over, they pay the balance to the borrower or the other person entitled to the mortgage property, who's usually the beneficial interest under a trust. OK, so that's in a situation where the um, bank who have forced the sale are usually the second charge or the second mortgage. So that illustration would look like this. If Abbey National had the first charge, the first mortgage in 2000, and Bradford and Bingley had the second in 2001, and Chelsea having one in 2002, you would consider the column on the left if Bradford and Bingley sold a property. What that would look like is that the, sec the sale by the second lender, Bradford and Bingley, would require the payment of the first lender, in that case, Abbey National. They'd then have to pay the legal fees of the sale itself. They'd then have to pay themselves if they hadn't been the first mortgagee, so Bradford and Bingley would be next. They would then pay any later creditors, such as the Chelsea charge, or any other secured loans on the property and then they would so that priority would be determined by the order of registration in that case a b c 2000 2001 then 2002 and then the remainder would go to the borrower and or uh, the beneficial interest under a trust that's what that priority would mean uh, so the people who have registered first come first in registration so last time we looked at how the borrower could hold off the bank under Section 36 of the Administration of Justice Act. Now we're thinking about whether the borrower could sell themselves instead of the bank. So this would be a situation where the borrower want to sell, obviously because they feel they could achieve more money than it going to auction or being a repossessed empty property. And this is available potentially under section 91.2 of the Law of Property Act 1925, which relates to the charges register, bearing in mind that's why we have focused on registered land to the extent that we have, because you should now know what the charges register looks like. So the registered charge would have that date on it in the box and state that the proprietor effectively becomes the bank so in any action the court on the request of the mortgagee next is the most important any person interested in the mortgage money or in the right of redemption that's the borrower may direct a sale of the mortgage monies so what that phrase within section 912 means is that the borrower can apply to the court for the right to sell the property. This is in a situation where the borrower would want to sell but the lender wouldn't agree. Potentially if the property is in negative equity that might be the case or they might just think it's going to be more attractive if they sell it. However, if the sale proceeds won't cover the whole debt and without consent 
the borrower might not be able to sell. Um, oh, we're going to have a situation where there will be a charge on the entry and the new buyer will see it. So you're going to have to deal with the bank. In the absence of their consent, we're going to have to go to court and apply for a court order. So the courts have got the ability to allow the bank, uh, to allow the borrower to sell it themselves. It's quite frustrating to look at some of the previous negative equity cases and see that the courts allowed the borrowers to sell and then owe the bank money. Because what can happen is somebody can walk away from a property, the security that was given for the loan, have sold it at a loss, declare themselves bankrupt and the bank never see their money. And if that happens repeatedly, like it did in 2008, um, the economy breaks, society breaks, and it's impossible for banks to feel like they can lend. So we see a range of negative equity cases in the 90s where times were tough and people were seen to be allowed to sell the property and walk away, owing the bank money. But that, that can't continue. So we see three cases where that was allowed to happen, where the borrower was given power to sell the property themselves without the bank's consent at a loss and walk away. In Polk, they couldn't keep up with the mortgage. They found a buyer. It didn't cover the outstanding debt, so therefore it was negative equity. The lender wouldn't agree to the sale, obviously. They preferred to rent it out. However, the evidence showed that the rental income would be less than the mortgage payments and would result in a large increase to the Polk's debt. Polk's applied for sale under Section 91 and the court allowed the sale under the exceptionality of circumstances. They considered equity and fairness, uh, but however, did start to become a bit of an escape route for people in negative equity. And we can see it used in Polonsky and Barrett. So in Polonsky, um, they weren't behind in their payments necessarily, but they wanted to move from a bad area and the bank refused because again, the property was in negative equity. The court allowed the sale again under Section 91 and said that they didn't have to consider purely financial matters as to why somebody might want to sell uh, and that they considered the, the welfare of the children and the sort of school they were in, etc. Just crazy. Uh, just crazy allowing a borrower to walk away from a contract with a lender and sell a property that is in debt without consent effectively taking on a personal debt that you can declare bankruptcy over. In Barrett, uh, again, we have Barrett behind on the mortgage. The bank agreed to the sale, but they wanted to control it. Um, I wouldn't let the borrower control it. Barrett applied for a Section 91 court order and the court made the order as they felt that Barrett could potentially achieve a higher amount even though it was still going to be a negative equity. So you have these three cases that allow lenders, uh, borrowers to sell in absence of consent from their lender. However, the door is shut on that in Cheltenham and Gloucester, PLC and Kraus in 1997. Uh, courts viewed there that Section 91.2 was uh, a very uh, unusual statutory provision and should only be used in exceptional circumstances. Uh, they did not want to open the floodgates to negative equity and that consumers could retain control of every sale in which there was either a default or some personal whim. Uh, Cheltenham and Gloucester felt that the previous cases had been wrongly decided and that if a borrower wanted to pursue a Section nine court, 91 court order, um, they had to do so before repossession and ensure that they could satisfy the bank's debt. So the, the uh, bank should control the sale if it's seeking it. 
and the court wouldn't postpone that unless um, they could prove and there was evidence that the sale would satisfy the debt. So a bit like Section 36, what this decision in Krauss does, it upholds the uh, decisions we had in Section 36 of the Administration of Justice Act whenever I looked at whether they could be uh, pay the entire sum. So it didn't apply to negative equity cases and Kraus upholds that when it comes to Section 91.2, shuts that door on the three bizarre decisions that we saw prior to that. I am going to get through these quite quickly because they're not particularly relevant and I've touched on them briefly before. Foreclosure is uh, where the agreed date has usually passed. Um, the lender could apply for foreclosure and the lender would get back the entirety of the property, no matter what would be remaining on the mortgage. Um, it's incredibly unfair. It's seen as extreme. Uh, the lender usually has to apply for a court order in order to get one. Uh, the order NISI would be where the orders uh, of the court make the borrower make payment within a certain time period. Otherwise, there would be foreclosure. And an order absolute would be that the property would then absolutely vest in the lender without any rights given to the borrower at all. Usually what would now happen is that uh, the borrower would allow sale under Section 91 if it's not in negative equity, obviously. So because of the existence of Section 91, um, Polk recognises that it's very very rarely used as as a remedy because it, it basically nullifies any existence of rights for the borrower um, and it, it wouldn't give them anything basically so foreclosure is a remedy that exists but is not used in modern property law instead it's more regular to either al allow for sale or control of the sale under section 91 and or appoint a receiver instead. So we've got power of appointment under section 109 of the Law of Property Act 1925. Um, again, meaning that the uh, receiver moves in in order to manage the property or a business. So it's usually where the mortgage property is a commercial entity. Uh, their function is usually to intercept money arising from the land and to pay off the mortgage and deals with situations where the borrower uh, is kind of responsible for the receiver rather than the bank becoming responsible. So they are an agent of the borrower rather than the lender. Because if the lender was mismanaging the property, they would be sued. However, in this case, the um, responsibility devolves down to the borrower. So it's, it's a way really with commercial property of ensuring that there's management of it without the bank having um, assumed some responsibility for that by putting it with a receiver instead. And finally, obviously, there remains the, the debt outstanding. So uh, that's where negative equity cases become unpleasant, where the, the amount of debt is not satisfied by the price received for the sale of the land then there could be a personal debt still remaining so the borrower always promises to repay in the deed of con uh, you know the deed of agreement for the mortgage and that allows for therefore a contractual right to sue for breach if the lender repossesses and the sale property is in negative equity the lender could still sue the borrower personally for the repayment of the debt and the limitation period on that would be 12 years. So they'd have 12 years within which to seek an action. Well, priority we've dealt with. So looking at the priority would be um, according to date. So thinking about when date, when we looked at the Abbey National, Bradford, Mingley and Chelsea, looking at the date at within which things have been entered otherwise other people would have priority over you as the mortgagee so what I wanted to do was uh, cover the right to sale and how a mortgagee should behave within that sale 
consider the impact of a sale and how a response how a mortgage or our borrower can respond to the sale seeing again similarly to repossession where the property is in negative equity their response mechanisms are very limited very briefly touch on the other remedies available to the bank so thank you again sorry for overrunning on this session but mortgages is very important so i had to cover it in a bit more depth thank you